So today I'm going to talk about what to say and when to say it. Just share some thoughts on that and then um, hear from all of you. But before we get into that, take some time to meditate. So find a comfortable position. Give yourself a chance to really arrive here. Take a few deep breaths. And settle in on focusing on your meditation object. Probably your in and out breathing, or whatever object really is working for you is fine. Let your awareness of your breath help your whole body to calm down, become relaxed and at ease. Let your attention broaden to take in your whole body. And breathing in as if the breath really permeates through the whole body. And then when we breathe out, consciously relax a little bit more, a little bit more.
as your body relaxes, you may start to feel a pleasant feeling arising somewhere in the body or in the mind. We want to notice these pleasant feelings so that they will expand, increase. And perhaps even fill the whole body. You might wonder how a mental feeling can fill the whole body, but it's because mental feeling has a counterpart, a way that it presents in the body. And it's different for different people. If the mental feeling is happy, joyful, then it most likely will bring relaxation and sense of opening, some soft, pleasant feelings, or sometimes even strong, pleasant feelings in the body.
if the mind is still active and not happy and calm, then we can bring in some thoughts that bring joy to the mind, particularly spiritual happiness. A reflection on what really inspires you. Maybe it's uh, thoughts of the Buddha or the Dhamma. Thoughts of your own generosity and kindness. Thoughts of your own virtue. Or maybe a little bit of that might bring energy and happiness to your mind.
Um, yeah, I thought I would talk a little bit about what to say and when to say it. That seems to be kind of a wish that we all might have it at certain times, especially when it's, it's really unclear um, how much to say about something and saying it to, to who <laughs> and when. So I, I, there are a few, I mean, the Buddha said a fair bit about speech and of course, we all know about the fourth precept. It's, you know, avoid lying. Um, the translation that we use generally is to refrain from false or harmful speech. And actually, in the Pali, it doesn't talk about harmful speech. It just says, don't lie. So that's, that's, the, that's the baseline. And then... In the simile of the saw in the middle length discourses, the Buddha talks about five aspects or courses or uh, qualities of speech, you might say. And one is, so he says that whatever other people say to you or whatever you say, it has these, these five elements to it. It's either true or it's not true. It's either sp spoken harshly or gently. It either has a good um, kind of purpose or a, a harmful purpose. It might be coming from a mind of loving kindness or a mind of mind of inner hatred. And it might be timely or untimely. And so many of you know about these, and I know some of you think about these before you might talk about something that's sensitive. But I'll just say a little bit, because um, there's obviously so many situations with regard to what we say and how we say it. Speech is often the hardest precept. People will talk about this. This is the hardest precept to keep. And there are so many gray areas. And this kind of way that the Buddha lays it out is very black and white. It's either gentle or harsh. Well, there's a lot of ground in between, maybe we might say. And so it's useful to reflect on how these might apply in a particular situation, especially the timely one. I think that's the one that we often don't think about. Oh, when is the right time to say something, especially something that's difficult to take in? And sometimes, especially living in community, uh, living in larger communities in particular, there's something that you think is important to communicate to someone, but there might just be this very brief window of opportunity. And if that passes by, you might not get another chance for a pretty long time. And it's usually helpful to just let that be. Of course, it does depend upon the gravity of, um, of what you need to say, too. So the Buddha talked about speech in this way, and it shows up in various places in the sutta, but you can see a really nice full description in the Middle Length Discourses, number 10, it's simile of the saw. He also mentions that when, in another place, he mentions that when someone asks us about another person's bad qualities, we shouldn't say very much. But if, if we're asked about their good qualities, we should say a lot. And when we're asked about our own good qualities, we should say a little. And if we're asked about our bad qualities, we should say a lot. It's kind of interesting. Um, there's a, I was just reading uh, one of the poems, verses of the enlightened monks, where he talks about don't, don't talk about people's bad qualities, because when we do, we, um, we overshadow or we ob ob obliterate or 
I can't remember what word he used, but we we kind of hide the good qualities of that person. And of course, if we're having a problem with someone, that's very easy to do. It's easy to focus on what's wrong. Uh, we have that same problem with ourselves a lot of times. Um, but uh, And it's important to try to bring balance into our perception if we can. And uh, the other thing that this person, this monk said is, it's, it's very important to not criticize um, others. Basically, he said, don't say things that are going to harm you or, or anyone else. So those are some useful guidelines. But of course, we have a lot of different situations that we find ourselves in. And sometimes, I think when people come to Buddhism, and they see that it's really about peace and harmony and, um, and seeing the good in things that sometimes it, it seems like, well, we should never say anything negative about anyone, especially if we read some of these, um, some of these passages. And that's actually not true. The Buddha also said it's important to praise what's worthy of praise and to blame what's worthy of blame and not the other way around. Because a lot of times it's important for people to know what's actually happening um, or what's actually, you know, um, needed for wisdom, what you need to know. And one of the places you find this uh, kind of going, going sideways, you might say, in, in Buddhist circles is when there are scandals and people are so devoted to a teacher that they're willing to overlook some really uh, harmful behavior and they feel like they can't talk about it with anyone. And, you know, it has the same many layers of difficulty as in other um, you know, environments, whether it's the workplace or in family or, or wherever, but if there's abuse going on, it takes on more, it takes on, I think, deeper layers, other layers when it's in a religious organization. And the Buddha often mentioned those mendicants who say they're celibate, but they're not. Uh, this was a problem 2,500 years ago. It's still a problem in a number of Buddhist circles. And a lot of times as nuns, we hear a lot of, we hear about these things. People come to us uh, sometimes and, um, and it's really challenging. It's very important for people to talk about what's happening and to try to be realistic, not, not so um, starry-eyed, not to put teachers so much on a pedestal that we um, forget about appropriate and inappropriate behavior. Having said that, there's also, you know, the, the warning to not gossip. If we look at the definition of right speech, of course, um, it's to avoid lying, to avoid harmful speech, to avoid divisive speech, to avoid gossip. Um, you know, it's, it's so we don't want to gossip, right? Yeah. So we have to look at, well, when, when is this, when is this really important to talk about? Not just that kind of very heavy thing, like um, very unskillful behavior or abuse, but anything you know when someone is being unskillful how do we approach it or someone comes and they talk about someone else being unskillful how do we approach it and the one one thing that i really admire that we see over and over again in the buddha's teachings and the discourses and the vinaya is that when someone would come to him to report the unwholesome behavior of another monastic he would immediately call that person to him and talk about 
ask them what, what they're doing, what their side of it is. Because of course, especially when we're triggered, we're emotional, we're um, uh, having you know, strong feelings or feeling hurt or angry, there's a very good chance. It's very easy to forget the, the other side of things and to not even really be able to see it. So when possible, we, to, to talk with the person, the other person as well about what their perception is of what's going on. So it's, it's um, that of course isn't always possible or it doesn't always, um, it isn't always appropriate. So then just bringing in as much of a, as deep an understanding as we can from what we know that gives people the benefit of the doubt, but also really acknowledges when things are, are inappropriate. Yeah. And to be able to say um, what that person is doing right now isn't correct but also to not like form a kind of an irrevocable negative judgment about them. So uh, we recently in the Sutta study read a, a, a poem in the Sutta Nipata where the Buddha says that the, the mendicant practicing, and of course this can be anyone, uh, lay people as well, when we're practicing, to realize nibbana, we're really purifying the mind. Then we we want to um, not look down on people for the way that they're uh, keeping precepts and the way that they're doing things. Now that doesn't mean that it's about being abusive or unwholesome. It's more about choices that are not of severe consequence uh, of harm, harm to themselves or others. So we get a lot of this in monastic life where, you know, people may feel if you eat two meals a day, you're totally not doing the right thing, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, if you decide to have a certain kind of food allowed in the afternoon, it's wrong or whatever. And, and, and the Buddha was discouraging that kind of criticism so much of this is to say how do we how do we sort out what's really wholesome and what's really unwholesome and what doesn't really matter and this this exercise has a lot to do with setting aside our our ego setting aside our own wishes and really trying to see the situation from a, a more detached perspective with wisdom. And a lot of times it's hard to do this without someone else's input or um, their perspective, another perspective that's less involved. And I'm sure you all know this. I think it's just useful to kind of come back to reflection on this so oftentimes it's important to talk to someone even though we don't want to spread rumors or gossip but this when we want to process something it's useful to have a good friend to process it with but it's also important to recognize what are the qualities that are that are important for this person to have or the way that they would listen to us so that we're not going deeper down the road of being um, caught up in a situation when, when you know, with a, with a one-sided view. So when we choose who to share um, some problem with, we want to choose someone who's not going to talk about it with anybody else. We want to choose someone who's not going to just agree with everything we say, but also someone who's really going to listen to us and not argue. <laughs> you know, it's a very, it's a very um, 
precious and wise position that we would want someone to take in being able to hear what's happening, to hold it, to not make negative judgments about the person that we're having issues with, but to really just hold it open and kind. And, and that, so that person really has to be trustworthy, able to listen, to, to be compassionate and wise. And then, you know, in certain situations, um, I've heard people I respect very much really acknowledge that the behavior they're hearing about is unwholesome or that they know from other kinds of experience that the person is someone who should, should handle very carefully because there is some danger there. And so this, this isn't against the sort of guidance of the Buddha. When something's wrong, we need to acknowledge that it's wrong. And, and we also need to understand like how much our perception um, can color what we're experiencing. So when we find someone, when we, when we need to want to or need to feel like we need to process something, which can be very important, because a lot of times we have trouble maybe even sorting out what we feel or what we've actually experienced. Um, and it can really help to put, a, put voice to it, to describe it, and to have someone who will really listen. And then, you know, it's, it's important um, that this person has a certain amount of experience too. So I've, I've um, known about a number of cases where like women might go to a, a traditional monk, um, you know, in a traditional culture and talk about abuses that are happening in her marriage. And they say, be more patient, have more metta. And of course, they, they don't understand the dynamics of such a of such a relationship. And it's it's really so it's important that even though we may really respect someone, that we that we also have the confidence that they can have some insight into what's actually happening. Um, and years ago, I I met a woman who was creating a program to train monks about domestic violence, which I thought was pretty great. You know, so it's like, of course, some of these examples may sound really extreme. Maybe your ordinary life doesn't uh, touch much of this, but uh, I know my life has, and it also is, is uh, something that can come up in any kind of society and any kind of environment. So we do want to be aware and sensitive and to know that it's not healthy, wholesome, skillful, or appropriate to keep things like um, abuses hidden. So how do we become the kind of person that someone can talk to and hold those kinds of uh, challenging um, conversations in trust and um, in balance. And of course, it, it can take some practice, but it also really helps to be able to listen and look after someone's needs in the moment and to take some time to reflect before saying much of anything. And um, Another area that is important to reflect on with regard to what to say and when to say it is when, to, when we talk about our practice. So I don't know if you've heard the advice to not really talk about breakthroughs in your practice very much with people, even teachers that you respect, because sometimes there can be a kind of erosion of the impact in our own mind. But other times, it's really important to talk about it, to be able to know how to carry whatever it is we've experienced forward. And it really does depend on who we talk to. Um, 
And sometimes you can tell if you start to talk about something, the reaction that comes suggests that, you know, this really isn't the right person to talk about this with. And I don't just mean that they don't agree that this is something profound or whatever, but if there's an if there's an edge in the response um, that's in any way putting you down, just stop and find a different person to confide in. Because it's important to hold these kinds of experiences carefully and and to always think in terms of not like, oh, look at me, I did this, I have this, but in terms of how do I carry this forward to fuller awakening? And as long as we have that, um, if we can sort that out in ourselves so that we're not kind of trying to gain some kind of um, glory for the ego and we're really sincerely interested in development, then it's also helpful to have a teacher or a spiritual friend who can really hear and encourage us to go forward. So there are a few thoughts on what to say and when to say it. And um, I'm interested in hearing from you. Yes, Lisa. Yes, thank you for um, delving into this again <laughs> and again. It's just such a complicated issue and there's so much at stake too and um, so many nuances to communication and um, even something that came up with, for me recently with a friend that caused a rift was about um, I guess you could call it being harsh or gentle but um, just using sarcasm inappropriately and um, and then it kind of snowballed and each of us was getting hurt and, um, but um, the more I think about it, we actually just kind of took a break from communicating um, to sort of try to get to some perspective. And um, there were some communication styles involved, I think too, which is adds other nuances about um, culture or family upbringing. Um, when it's appropriate to interrupt other people and um and you know i enjoy sarcasm <laughs> sometimes it can be um communication isn't always just about exchanging information it's it's can be playful and and fun and even um you know some people go as far as trash talking i don't think i like that but <laughs> i can see how it's fun but a little dangerous yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Lisa. Yeah, it's so true. There's so much about our habits and our conditioning that um, feeds into the way we communicate and the way we perceive the communications of others. That it takes some investigation to unpack some of that. And, and again, it's like if we can dredge up the tolerance uh, for our own for our own conditioning and for the conditioning that other people have uh, that helps a lot um, it it's it's so easy to think that the way I do it or the way I'm used to have things happening is the right way um, I remember an example Ajahn Pasto gave once in the monastery because he said this is this just constantly comes up living in community, especially uh, for me, my experience of living at Amaravati, which is truly an international community, you could just see how conditioning and different kind of values and, and experiences would rub up against each other. And, and, um, and Ajahn Pasto one day said, yeah, you, you know, you 
we just think the way I do it or the way I want it is the right way. So like somebody will be, you know, like, okay, we only have brown sugar. You put brown sugar in tea and it's like, no, we can't do that. <laughs> you, know, and, you know, that kind of thing. And, and, um, and, and the, the important point I think is that all of these things um, are an opportunity for us to investigate the mind. Is if we are if we if we don't rub up against these other ways of thinking of things and doing things, we we lose an opportunity to really sort of unpack the layers of conditioning of our own minds. And if our goal is to awaken, to purify the mind, to be free of all all of the you know harmful biases in particular, breed hatred and delusion, then these are precious opportunities, even when they seem quite trivial, to really um, look at, you know, what am I clinging to? So, yeah, thank you. Val? Um, thank you for this talk. It was really timely for me. Um, I have found myself in a place where my mind is not as pure as it was like a month ago, <laughs> you know, last month was like a really high point in my practice. And, and now I'm, you know, suffering a lot of dukkha. And it's interesting as I go on, on the path, you know, I, when those waves, those peaks and valleys come and go and every new one I am a little bit more aware of my mental states and my behaviors and things like that um, but I had not thought about how right speech can change when um, you know when I was a little bit more pure of mind last month versus now and it's like, oh, yeah, look, you know, yesterday you were gossiping about someone at work. Wow, look at that. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's really fascinating. Thank you. A little bit of an indicator on our spiritual health, which changes as much as our physical health. You know, if we, if we, um, as we're kind of... <laughs> finding our way through the, the gradual training. It's not just a steady uphill, um, victory upon victory experience. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> and the good news is when we go through some of those um, hills and valleys for a while, then we, when we're in the valley, we know, okay, there's gonna be another hill. I just have to hang in here. Um, this is a good time to be more quiet. You know, sometimes we'll have a state of mind where it's like, well, I don't want to express myself from this place. Let me wait. Let me use my tools to calm the mind to really, and I don't mean ever covering things up. This now, this doesn't work. You know, it's not, um, it's not trying to put a happy face on it. It's, it's about understanding it. And it comes right back to the first noble truth. We need to really look at things the way they are and then work with them. Yeah. And we you. will know that it, it, it will change again, <laughs> whatever it is. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah, thank you, Val. Thank you. Neil? Um, so something Lisa said got me thinking, um, you know, I, it, I think right speech is actually about more than speech, uh, mm -hmm. especially now, you know, with the internet and all oh, that yeah. stuff. And I almost wonder if a, a more, a better translation nowadays would be right communication. Mm -hmm. um, and I wonder if you had anything 
to add to what you've already said with regard to, you know, internet stuff, because the opportunities for wrong speech are so much greater nowadays. You're absolutely right. I mean, back at the Buddhist time, you know, what happens when you say something, even to a group of people, it's, it doesn't have anywhere near the reach that we have now. Right now, our words can go around the world in a, in a second, practically. And it is so important to remember this. I really appreciate bringing this whole aspect up because, you know, what we write, emails, texts, messenger, or whatever our mode is, this is what we're, this is what we're putting, we're creating something in the world, we're creating something in other people's minds. Another aspect I didn't talk about, whether it's just verbally between two people, or it's, it's um, putting it out there for anyone, anywhere to see, is the fact that we actually impact other people with our speech. This is so important that, you know, why did the Buddha place so much importance on the avoidance of gossip and frivolous talk? Because we're affecting the states of other people's minds as well as our own. We really do, um, you know, you know how it is when you hear things, it has an impact. So yeah, we try to practice sense restraint for that reason, not listening to things that are going to bring about unwholesome thought patterns. We have to be careful not to generate that too. And when we consider writing what's true and not untrue, coming from a, a good purpose, coming from a heart of loving kindness, coming from a place of being gentle, not harsh, <clears throat> saying what's appropriate at the time, that'll slow us down. If we could just get that embedded in our fingers, that would really help, <laughs> you know, like muscle memory for this, okay? We got to really like <laughs> plant it in there. Um, and, and oftentimes the right thing is to wait write that message, look at it again later before it blasts off into the universe. And I know uh, people who have learned this in the workplace where they've had a few rough communications where you're really talking across purposes and not really understanding each other and, and how painful that can be all around and how, and how counterproductive it can be. And then to pause. Um, and and it's, it's really helpful. You know, I mentioned a little bit about not talking, not, not communicating from certain states of mind, which is, you know, part of that five things. You know, it's like, so it's, it's really helpful to, whenever possible, work through our own emotions before we communicate. And then, like I said, when, when we need help working through our emotions, do it with the right person. It's not going to go any farther. It's not going to, it's not going to hurt them or, or uh, spread anywhere. So this is, uh, these are, these are to some, in some way, ideals. We don't, none of us always, you know, does the right thing, says the right thing at the right time, clearly, you know, um, <clears throat> a lot of times we don't think about the right thing to say until the, the, the opportunity is long past. And I figure if, if it took me, you know, six months or three years or whatever it is to think of the right thing to say, you know, there's no hope you're going to get that right in the moment. But maybe there's a chance for the next time that it gets a little bit easier. And so we have to be lenient in some ways. And precisely stringent in others like don't um we want to say don't cover over unwholesomeness but also 
give ourselves and each other the the latitude to make mistakes and for that to be okay. One of the things I've talked about a few times already um, in other times is this idea of rewind. And you can actually have a, a protocol that says, wait, <laughs> let's rewind. Let's go back to that point where I said this and you said that, and then let's take it from there in a, in a more wholesome way. Um, and I, I had a friend that where we did that repeatedly uh, anytime um, we were living in the same house. So you, you have a lot of chances to cross, <laughs> cross. and, um, <clears throat> and it really worked beautifully, but you had to have both of us had to be on board and um, you know, just maybe finding ways, especially finding ways to be more generous with ourselves and more understanding of, you know, all the different ways that we, you know, do things that are, that are less than ideal um, and that it's okay. Mistakes were made. We can say that about anyone's life, anyone's um, experience. And it's one of the great teachers, so. Being, being willing to accept it and let it go. It's so important. You know, you've got me thinking. Um, my, my first thought was that um, the, the internet and all the telecommunications that we have create so many more opportunities for wrong speech, but at the same time, we have a lot more opportunity um, to either correct it or, like you said, to pause. You know, I mean, when you're speaking to someone, it's just right out there. But, you know, when, like you said, when you're typing an email, you know, you have the opportunity to sit back, look at it again. Um, so, I mean, there's a positive side to it, too. Yeah. It's just a thought. And it's all practice if we take it that way. And I really think we should take everything that way. We're practicing for awakening. And if we think, if we, if we take it like that, if we, if we look at things that way, then, you know, whatever situation we find ourselves in, you know, if we do have that chance to pause, to reflect, to bring in wisdom and kindness, that changes us. We're developing. Um, we're developing our character. We're developing the stuff that will come with us after we die. It's way more important than making money. Way more important than having stuff. Even more important than having lots of friendships. First and foremost, we purify our own mind. Develop our own character. And then all that other stuff, whatever we need in life, whatever, you know, that all kind of falls in line after that character development. <laughs> and during, too. I don't mean, you know, just at the end or anything of, of um, perfecting anything. But it's like the more we, the more we can develop wisdom and compassion, kindness and generosity, you know, virtue, um, other, other aspects of life just follow suit. We don't have to be so concerned about all that. Paula? I want to go back to where you said that um, the Buddha said that when someone, I think you said the Buddha said that when someone asked about a particular individual's bad qualities to say little, and if they, you know, good qualities say a lot. And my question is, is um, let's say that you're having an issue with someone and you need to process that. Mm -hmm. Um, and that issue has to do with um, qualities that may not be desirable. 
Um, and you can't really process it unless you talk about it to a um, good friend. So then yes. how do you handle that? You talk about it directly. This is why it's important who that good friend is. You know, you, this is this is why we have to take what we see in uh, the suttas and we have to look at the very many, many different ways the Buddha would talk about something because it all has different um, facets. And it's not just, oh, I just don't say anything about the bad things that are happening. We need to talk about them. And it's even appropriate sometimes if a, there's a person with very bad sila or something that, that it becomes to be on the lookout for this behavior and this this person's attitudes. So this is, you, you, you're right on it, Paula. It's like, when we want to talk about what's happening, um, we, we want to do it with someone who's going to pick it up in the right way. Acknowledge that we're just talking about it from our own perspective. We're aware that uh, there might be other things happening. One of the things that I find really difficult, really challenging, is to not let someone's negative view of a person and their words about them immediately distort my view and value of that person. This is something that takes a lot, I find, takes a lot of uh, mindfulness and, and wisdom to hold open the possibility that this isn't entirely true or accurate. Not because the person wants to be untrue or lie, but it, because we all have our perceptions. We're seeing something from our point of view and we can't even know all of what else is going on. So to, to really be able to listen, acknowledge and, and, and um, take seriously what someone is saying to us but to not automatically transfer that into our opinion of this person. And also there's a big difference between hearing about facts or hearing about opinions. So a lot of times we don't make a clean separation. Like you can find out, you can verify that someone actually did a certain thing, perhaps, but you can't necessarily verify um, what might be um, derived from that as an opinion about this person. So people will have their opinions. They're colored by our own experience, by our own conditioning. And so this is the, these are things we can be more discerning around. And that's important. But to remember that it is really important to talk about, process through issues that we're having with people and what we feel they're doing. <coughs> but remember that this is our perspective. And we can even encourage the person we're talking to about it, to hold it as th this is my side of the story. I know there's another side of the story. But this is, this is what I've got, and this is what I need to work through. And so, you know, these kinds of conversations uh, really can vary in a very long range of what skillful, unskillful to skillful. And so our, our wish is to become more skillful in these conversations. Um, so it's, it's, um, it's, it, it is what you say. We don't, we don't. I don't think it's healthy at all. I don't think it accords with the Dhamma to think I'm only going to say nice things. You know, like if you don't have anything to say, or if you don't, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. Uh, no, <laughs> I mean, there are times when that's true, <laughs> when that's good advice, but there are other times when it's really important to be completely upfront about what we feel is happening. We want to help ourselves and everyone be more wholesome. It doesn't help to try to cover up what's going on. I, th I think I, I understand that aspect of it. 
Um, it's not that I, I completely understand that if there's a wrong going on, you mm -hmm. should talk about it. It would be more of a slightly lesser, more yeah. like something that um, someone's possibly personality that you have difficulty mm -hmm. dealing with. Not that they're a bad person or anything. Yeah. That's the kind of thing that would be not as jump in your face kind of, yeah, obviously you should talk about that. That's what I was thinking of. And it's still, what you said still applies, I think. Yeah, still talk about it. Because we want to work through these things. We don't want them festering under the surface. And it's true, the, the, the grayer it looks, the harder it is. It's, you know, but it's amazing how sometimes things that might seem to the to the outside observer to be quite black and white isn't when you're in it. It still feels gray a lot of times, even if everyone else in the world would say, hey, <laughs> that's very black and white. <laughs> so just to know that, yes, when, when we, whatever the, whatever the issue is, we do have, it is important, I think, to honor what feelings arise. You know, we can be having a conversation with someone and the words can be okay, but there's a strong feeling that there's something off. And then it's important to look at it. And there's nothing wrong with talking about it with a trusted friend. As long as that doesn't bleed out into an, an inappropriate um, conclusion about whatever was going on there with that person. Does that make sense? Thank you. Yeah. Well, I hope this was helpful. And I would be happy to hear from you, any of you about um, topics that you would like to hear about on Saturday morning. And uh, it's always nice to know that at least somebody, this is going to uh, hit home for someone, you know, so feel free to just send me a message or something to let me know.